Welcome to another edition of Iowa Magazine Extra, an interview program set to run as a companion for stories published in Iowa Magazine. This afternoon, we're talking with Robin Green about the intersection of writing, television, and music. Robin grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and did her undergraduate work locally at Brown University. She started a career in journalism, including a stint at Rolling Stone, and we'll get to that later in this conversation. After that, she came to the University of Iowa to enroll in the Iowa Writers Workshop. Following the graduation from the workshop and receiving her MFA, she took off for California, where she was able to launch a successful career in television as a writer, producer, and creator. She stays very active with the University of Iowa as a teacher, mentor, and consultant. Robin is married to Mitchell Burgess, her business partner, and also a UI alumnus, and they call New York home. Today, we're here to talk about the intersection of her career in journalism, television, and music. Good afternoon, Robin. Hi, Jeff. Good to see you. It's great. It's great to see you, too. It's been, been too long, but um, I'm glad to know that you're doing well, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Well, let's jump into the conversation. Starting out, what are some of your earliest memories of music in your life? Well, you know, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and the big deal was uh, uh, records would come from New York of, of musicals. And so when we were six and seven and eight and nine and 10, we would uh, listen to all the musicals. I guess it was South Pacific and Pajama Game. I got to be 13 and Elvis Presley was, you know, was the only thing I ever stole was an Elvis 45. You know, I shoplifted it. But um, I guess do you remember what do you remember which one? No, probably blue suede shoes. <laughs> but um, and also um, the Everly Brothers, I think, were around that time. And then when I was sixteen, uh, Ray Charles, you know. Right. So and and that was a different sort of thing entirely. And, and parents would go away, and we'd have these Ray Charles dance parties, you know, and drink booze and stuff. <laughs> it was a different kind of uh, music, mm-hmm. and that's that's like. My childhood into my my naughty teens. <laughs> that is such a a great view of sort of the American music scene. And so then you you graduate college, you start your career in in journalism. You work for uh, Marvel Comics, I believe, for Stan Lee for a while. Yeah, you know, I went to New York and tried to you know do that New York uh, career girl thing, and just. I saw this copy of Rolling Stone, you know, I was, I was an early reader of it, I guess. I remember standing on a street corner and seeing, you know, Eric Clapton was on the cover with his hair and his beads and his, you know, dungaree shirt. And here I am surrounded by these straight looking people with briefcases and stuff rushing back to work. The way that magazine looked was for me. Mm -hmm. In other words, that's, that's what I wanted. I didn't know how to get there, but then um, and I was a waitress mostly with my, you know, Pembroke education, my Brown education and, um, you know, making jewelry, taking, not hula, but, you know, what's a Middle East dance? Well, like belly dancing? Or- belly dancing lessons. Belly dancing lessons on Telegraph Avenue. <laughs> I was completely happy. Um, and then I, I went to Rolling Stone. A friend gave me a, the name of someone to go see there and I went there to become a you know secretary which is all that a girl could really be then Mm -hmm. and um the man that she had sent me to had been her boss when she was in publishing in New York and now he was doing Straight Arrow Press which is the Rolling Stone was the Rolling Stone new publishing arm and so I went to see Alan Rensler and he said I heard you're a good writer I was a star writer at Brown you know I was it Kind of. I was the editor of the literary magazine and all that. Mm-hmm. Total surprise. <laughs> there it was, you know, my short stories were good, I guess, you know. And so, um, and John Hawks was, you know, very important. He later got me into the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, he was my mentor at Brown. My, you know, he championed me. Um, and so he said, I hear you can write. And he arranged for me to meet Jan Wenner. Mm-hmm. So I went and interviewed with Jan. And um, Jan wanted an article on Marvel Comics. And that was it. I went back with David to New York and uh, did the article. David took the pictures and it landed on the cover. And, that, <laughs> and not only is that a, a, a great story about how your career launches, but 
So at that time at Rolling Stone, you were the first woman on the masthead. So you're the first well, woman. I, 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 I was the first, I was the only woman contributing editor. Okay. And the first writing woman, really. I, I don't know if I was actually the first, because somebody's wife was uh, for okay. a, a year early on. Um, she was gone. And there might have been other women on the masthead, but I was the only con girl contributing editor along with all of the men, Hunter, all of that there were 20 men or 30 men and me so yeah I was but I didn't you don't feel like a tra trailblazer you're just you know doing what is available I suppose when, and you were also opening the doors from Rolling Stone was transitioning just from a music publication Jan Wenner was a big music guy and there was record reviews concert reviews artist profiles into more of a culture publication that it is today. So you were branching out in that. Tell us about that transition. Well, it, it was already happening by the time I got there. You know, there's musicians were speaking out and um, they had opinions, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, it just was a very natural transition. Um, I don't, I, it didn't feel like a transition. I was just sent on stories. I never said I want to do this story. I was always sent on stories. Um, I wasn't a huge font of original ideas. I, I didn't have any, I didn't intend this career. So I would just go where they sent me. And it was usually as a sort of hitman to just say something ironic, say about the Bee Gees or, uh, you know, uh, Black Sabbath or, or David Cassidy. Um, what a cruel thing to send me after David Cassidy. But that was, you know, and did Dennis Hopper and all the, you know, I was sort of sent there as a, a, an ironic force. Do you know what I mean? A critical ironic force. So I can't say that I really did any serious transitioning. I can't really, I can't claim that. I'm sorry. Well, in every conversation we have, I'm always learning more about the range. I mean, when you can put, the Bee Gees, Black Sabbath, and David Cassidy in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good work. Yeah. I, I should never have been, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and me, you know, but, you know, and then I spent five days touring with uh, David Cassidy and I pretty much ended his career, you know, as a teen idol. Um, but he was tragic all by himself, you know? He, yeah, that's, that's really an incredible story. Yeah, he, juggling television and what he was trying to do as a musician. Yeah, and he he uh, you know he wanted to be considered as an adult because he was a child star and pretended to be a musician, and so he wanted to cover of Rolling Stone. So the line was, "We gave it to him," and um, and then it he he left he left the public eye for and went to Hawaii for a while, you know. But then he came back, and you know, then he destroyed himself all by himself. Yeah. you know it wasn't just me um, but, uh, yeah, know, is. I, but I did cover the culture in, in a kind of critical and ironic way but you know other people were covering Charles Manson and um, th this other Mel Lyman this other kind of post you know it was a pre they were precursors to Jim Jones mm -hmm. you know these older men would kind of get these young people in sway in one way or another and I did this kind of low rent one funny one you know, I, I did, but it was all published in a, in a book called Mind mm -hmm. which was not the best title to give a book because, you know, you couldn't like go in there and ask for it, really. <laughs> you know, you'd be ashamed. So, um, so that's the way in which I covered the culture, you know, in a kind of, I wasn't surprised when Jim Jones happened, for instance. You know, and I, I spent a lot of time with Hunter and he was doing all that political stuff, which was so brilliant. Um, and so funny and, and really holds up. I've, I've read some of it recently. Let, let's transition out to the University of Iowa. So you leave Rolling Stone. And well, I, I didn't leave. I was I was taken off the masthead. I didn't turn in a story that I was supposed to turn in. OK. For various reasons. And, and then I was kind of lost and I kept writing for a couple of years. But I met this girl whose boyfriend was at the Iowa. He had been at the Iowa Writers Workshop Poetry Division. It just sounded so great to me to go back to the university where I felt safe because it was dangerous at, at that point in my life. You know, I was in a little bit of danger and lost too. you know, sort of 
mentally or, or uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any ambition. And so I thought, okay, I'll start over again. This Iowa thing sounded great. Um, I, I applied to get in. What was that transition like? Well, I'll tell you, um, I can't remember. I must have flown, I suppose. But I remember being in a phone booth talking to my mother and saying, it's beautiful here. I was so surprised because it was so pretty and it wasn't all flat. It was very, you know, uh, there was a lot of beautiful terrain and, there were the, you know, it was August, it was hot, but the trees were all in bloom and it was just a really pretty place. And it was like Providence in that it was leafy. There was a small college town. Um, mm-hmm. I just felt very at home there and uh, safe. So, Robin, we talked a little bit about life in Iowa City. You're busy writing. You're busy teaching uh, a couple shows at the mill. But what else did you do in your free time when you were on campus? I was always an artist, you know, so I took classes in the art department, which is excellent there. So I would go there and um, take drawing. You have an excellent art department. So I made good use of that. And um, but I also led my studious, you know, reading and and going to classes life you know I just settled down a little bit I had been a little wild out there in San Francisco and so I think I think it was just a quieter time for me and then I met Mitch (laughs) then I met Mitch you know I was a teaching writing fellow and he had just gotten out of the Vietnam army and so he was on the GI Bill and um, I had never taught before and, uh, you know, there were just a bunch of 19 year old kids. And that was OK. because I was 30 at this point. But in comes this guy out of breath, breathing heavy as a man. And he's like he, he was 24, almost 25. And he just gotten out of the army. And he came into my class. A rhetoric teacher had complimented his writing and said, you're a writer. <laughs> the, the rhetoric teacher said, you belong at the I.O writer's workshop why don't you go take a writing class and so he came actually to the wrong class and it was my class and we didn't get together until after the semester was over but then we did so you meet mitch you graduate you receive your mfa mitch graduates with a degree in history but a year semester- later he graduated yeah i worked in the uh autistic children's hospital for david horowitz oh wow i didn't realize That's quite that. a story. yeah so and then you have this sort of american writer entertainment dream you load up a car and you move to california yeah we bought mitch's brother's little brother's car for 200 bucks this like i think it was a 64 chevy impala two-tone but anyway so we had that car with a small uh, custom steering wheel it was very odd and barely made it over the continental (laughs) divide so after iowa it just seemed like a good idea to go to la because they you know there was work for writers there and I was one, you know, I, I could do that, you know, I could maybe do that for a living. And so, and Mitch, you know, <laughs> he didn't know whether he should leave Iowa City or not, but he ended up going and uh, we went out to L.A. together and just and didn't get into television. It took like years of, of just kind of living and getting settled. And we were temp sex. You know what that is? Temporary secretaries. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, the, Low, lowest of the low. <laughs> and um, so we did that for years and he had a, you know, we had different careers. And then I started getting back into journalism again. And my journalism, there was a fella at Iowa, Iowa Connection, John Falsey, who had been in my, not my year, but he'd been in his classes with me at the workshop. Really talented, handsome boy. And um, he had done, you know, I was a big champion of his work in the workshop. Um, very conventional stories, but that's fine with me. And he was the only one. And now everybody publishes constantly from the workshop um, in magazines and books, but then it was really rare. And John Falls, he published a short story in the New Yorker, which was like the gold standard. And he, it was, he was lured out to Hollywood on the strength of that short story to be, you know, to sell his soul as a TV writer. <laughs> so we knew that that had happened. And he used to play basketball with Mitch. So we kind of knew him, but we, we might've gone over to his apartment um, once while, when we first got out there. Um, and uh, so we knew that he worked in television, but I would never ask him. That, uh, we didn't ask him to help us or anything like that. But I got into journalism again. It was because, and, and, and Mitch was doing his own thing then. And um, 
somebody, I guess John, I was doing these second string restaurant reviews as, in addition to my day job as an editor of a magazine with Harold Hayes, which is another whole chapter of my life. This brilliant um, magazine editor from New York who was respond who you know invented new journalism um, at Esquire, you know, and sent John Janae John Janae to the Chicago Convention and hired wow. Tony Baylor and Tom Wolfe and all of that sort of thing. Harold was legendary. And I was working for him and, and um, working at night as a restaurant reviewer. And John, who had started, a sh- he, he'd got, he's been a television writer, and then he had his own show called The Year in the Life. And he worked with Josh Brand. That was his partner, another writer. And they read my restaurant review. And, and John said, you know, she's a really good short story writer, and we're trying to do an Updikian show. She, and she will know what that means. <laughs> so... Um, and they gave me a chance to write a TV script, and that was the beginning of my career. It was episode one after the pilot of Year in the Life. And by the way, uh, uh, Year in the Life, the the um, miniseries won you know the Emmy that year over Winds of War and everything. It was a really quality show with Richard Kiley and Sarah Jessica Parker as a young girl. So I write this episode. It's episode one. Um, of the series that was to come. And, you know, Alan Arkin is saying my words. It was just like I had died and gone to heaven. And that was the beginning of my television career. But um, music was not that big a part of that. That show was probably scored. And there's a difference between scored shows that, you know, will score, uh, have a musical score that someone will write to cue in like a feeling that you're supposed to have or something. Um, or mood for a scene, or you know, it, it's just that kind of thing. Or the other, the alternative is um, practical, which is like it's on the radio. Mm-hmm. That was in Sopranos. We use practical. David was very against score, and so my second year in television, I went to work for David Chase. Had a show. David Chase was the creator later of of uh, Sopranos, much later, and so David had a show called Almost Grown which is a music person, you know, it was a Chuck Berry mm-hmm. song. Mm-hmm. And um, that show was all about music. That show, the conceit of that didn't, it was very short lived, <laughs> but it was so good with, you know, Tim Daly and Eve Gordon. And uh, that was so much fun to write. But what would happen is it was about this couple that had been divorced and, and, um, but still loved each other. And, or something like that. And anyway, um, music that would be on the radio or somewhere would take them back into a time when they loved each other or when an earlier time. But it was all about this practical music, you know? So it was for me, uh, the first episode I did like that was Mockingbird. Remember Mm. Mockingbird? Carly Simon, James Taylor tune? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not, no, the earlier one, the, the teeny bopper version. You know? Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. going to buy me a diamond ring. And if that diamond ring don't shine, yeah. they're going to buy me something. I don't know. But, mm-hmm. but you know, it was that whole mocking bird thing. But anyway, so um, that show is all about music. David is a huge music person. And so music was a, a enormous part of the Sopranos too, but always practical. And he, you know, we had in both shows and in, uh, in, in uh, Year in the Life as well. And oh, oh, and then Northern Exposure was huge about music too. We had, you know, the, the DJ there. Yeah, and Chris and everything. And that's, and that's kind of, a, let's, let's play off of that angle because Northern Exposure, you have Chris, the DJ, who is the, the storyteller or sort of the, the fiber um, his his monologues that he'd give yeah. during the radio show would kind of like kick things around, act as its transition. So you had somebody running the local radio station, playing music, but also telling these stories about what's going on in life. And then, I mean, Sopranos, everything from the iconic opening scene that has just been redone with Jamie Lynn Sigler doing the, the car commercial. Yeah. Um, and, and the, uh, the, the background music at Vesuvio being sort of either Sinatra or the oldies, or there was always the closing credits the the, the music selection there would just, you can put yourself back. Now, when you hear some of the songs, you hear kinks living on a thin line. You think about Sopranos now. Yes, that's right. Well, and, you know, Brad, in both those shows, and I think 
year in the life, but also definitely almost grown and on an, and, and northern exposure, those that that was quality television. It was sort of the birth of quality television. When I came back to Iowa, when Mitch and I went back to Iowa early on in our TV career, we could have come from another planet. And TV was very disreputable. You know, a real writer wouldn't work for it, but quality television was coming, you know, into its own. And so, and we had on those shows a special person devoted to music. Do you know what I mean? So he, you know, was Martin Bruce Lee. And in his office, he had like every music you could possibly imagine. You know, it, it wasn't on Spotify. It was like in a shelf and uh, not in records necessarily, but definitely CDs and that kind of thing. He had like every CD you could possibly imagine and access to more, you know. So music and David Chase, who was very into music and probably wanted to be a musician, um, I think definitely did actually and had a band at one point as a kid. Um, he would play endless music over a scene. Um, that was his ballywick. No one really participated with him in that. That's what he liked to do. That's where he took his pleasure mm -hmm. and uh, earned, you know, it was, the, it was the icing on it all. You know, it was, the, I think, the happiest he was when Martin would send him music to put over a scene. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a writer, so um, you're writing, the White Caps episode of Sopranos, which I believe you oh, and, yeah. and you and Mitch won an Emmy for that. Is that we correct? Did. We wrote it with David. We split the credit with them. Yeah. Okay. So when you when you're writing um, an episode of, we'll just stick with Sopranos here. Do you have music or something in your mind that you're saying like, this is how it would be said or this would be happen or is that turned over to David? I don't recall that at all. No, it would be a David thing. It would be, and it would happen after, you know? Yeah. I mean, that last scene, we didn't, I, I never actually saw in the last episode, but I understand that there was a certain record playing on the jukebox. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was a last minute decision what the music was. I, I just, I don't know about that. But no, uh, music, I don't think, I think that almost grown, you did know what the music cue was gonna be because that was more of a big part of it, part yeah. of the script. Nobody watched the show. It was a shame. It was so much fun. It was so good. I've got, I've got to look it up. You did. The premise is intriguing. Oh, it was wonderful. You would love it. Um, it was it was adult. It was uh, funny. You know, David's stuff is always dark but funny. You know, and then, oh, and I'm the kind of music person. I remember, you know, we had these great offices on Universal Lot uh, right on the tour. So you would hear like, um, and now, you know, you'd hear the guy in the loudspeaker taking these tours on tour. Now we're going by uh, the bungalows where the writers are hard at work, so we must be very quiet here. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we've been talking with Robin Green, UI alumna, Writers Workshop graduate, trailblazer in television as a producer, a writer, and a creator. And today we've been talking about the intersection of her personal and professional life with music. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Robin. Thank you for having me. It's really been fun. It's been a been a pleasure. Be well. <laughs>